Okay, so last time we got player movement working, and let's just play that quickly just to feel it. <laughs> yep, that all still works. That's all we've got. Uh, we don't have the next most important ingredient for a video game, which is shooting, uh, for the kinds of conventional video game we're making anyway. So, we before we get to that though, I just want to, there's one thing I want to tweak about our movement because it will be useful for our, our projectile stuff. Uh, so actually one thing I see right away is this comment is out of date. <laughs> there is, uh, some programmers don't like comments for this exact reason because they're not, the game doesn't run them. That means they can get out of date and you don't notice and then they're just lying. <laughs> but that's only really relevant for like bigger teams. Um, this is no longer a mouse button that clicks and moves us forward. In fact, all of this is movement. Or let's, let's say WSD to move, be specific. And this debug line was just a thing for testing, just to illustrate something to you, so I'm going to delete that. So now our code is a bit neater. And then the thing I want to change is that um, we declared this variable speed here. And just because it's a weird word, I'm going to add a reminder here. You can add comments after a line. If you do that double slash, it knows that everything after the double slash can be ignored. Um, and I'm just going to remind us that float is short for floating point number, which is basically just a normal number. Uh, it's just the normal kind of number we're going to be using. And you have to tell Unity what kind of variable a variable is when you declare it, which is what we're doing there. And because we declared it there, if we wanted to do something like, remember that debug log thing I was doing earlier? If I wanted to log the, the um, thing speed on startup, uh, it's going to tell me it can't do that. It doesn't know what it's, the name speed doesn't exist in this current context. What are you talking about? Speed? I don't know speed. And that's because we declared it down here. So uh, the way to think of this is uh, imagine player behavior. We're at the Institute of Player Behavior, a, a big building full of people discussing things about player behavior. The update meeting room where we've been doing all our business is a whole bunch of people talk like somebody in that meeting stands up and says, okay, speed is going to be this kind of thing. It's going to be a floating point number. Uh, over here in the start room where people are talking about what we should do on startup, they haven't heard that. They don't know. Like, they don't know what speed is. No one's told them what speed is. So uh, if we declare something here, it can only be used here. If you declare a variable inside of update, it can only be used inside of update. Um, so we want to declare it in a way that all these individual meeting rooms can all know about it. And so we just do it up top. We put it right at the top. So this is, just to be absolutely clear, it's after this opening brace because it's part of player behavior. It's within, you remember these braces sort of section off a chunk of code and say, this is what we're talking about. So player behavior, it's all of this. It's got to be within that. But it's outside of start or update. It's not in any of the individual meeting rooms. It's like a tannoy going across the whole building. Hey, everybody, speed is this. Speed is a floating point number. Tom says floating point is basically a normal number, which isn't technically true, but let's not get into it. <laughs> and now that we've done that, uh, this line of code is almost valid, just needs a semicolon. Now we can log the speed on startup. We don't especially want to do that, but um, uh, I'm doing this now, making this change now, because we can actually do another thing here. Um, if we also put the word public in front of it, that means not only does everything inside of player behavior know about it, but now things outside of player behavior can also know about it. And if we go back to Unity, now that we've done that, if we click on our player, over by player behavior, there's now a speed field. It's kind of magical. It's um, uh, a thing that we can edit. So I can actually change this to, let's try 20. And now let's play our game. Now movement is slightly faster. And actually, I kind of prefer it like that. Like I thought 20 was going to be too fast, but that feels kind of nice. Uh, and the beautiful thing is we can even change it while the game is running. I can change it to 50 right now. I'm still playing the game and now I'm sliding all over the place. And I can change it back to 10. And I'm back to this glacial pace. Now there's two pitfalls here. Two things you got to watch out for. One is, let's say I spent ages tuning this and I ended up at like 13.596 and this is the exact right value for speed. This is scientifically proven to be the perfect speed. And then, okay, that's perfect, I'm done. I unclick play, it's gone, I've lost it. <laughs> that number's gone, that work is lost. Any changes you make to things during the game, while the game is running, uh, are lost when you stop playing. So when, 
if you change stuff while the game is running, it's a great tool that lets you adjust things and fine tune them. But bear in mind, all your work is temporary. It's just just for this session. It's like it's like using cheat codes or something. Like that is not going to be saved um, into your project. You're just experimenting. And so that is why you might have noticed this episode, whenever I go into play mode, everything goes orange. That's because I did something um, that I strongly recommend you do. Go to edit preferences. And uh, along the side here, there's, there's a section called colors. A million colors is a bit garish. But the one we want is play mode tint. By default, this is the faintest gray, the suspicion of gray. As if gray was once here, but is now long since left. <laughs> which means you can barely tell if you're in play mode or not. Being in play mode is a massive deal. You have to know that. You have to be acutely aware of that because otherwise you can do work that gets lost and we absolutely want to avoid that. It's a pain no one should experience. So um, instead of a very faint gray, I've gone with this color, which is a sort of bright, sunny orange. Whatever you choose, it will be much darker than you think because it's going to bring the, the tone down. But yeah, pick a, pick a strong color, vivid one. Um, and then anytime you're in play mode, you know you're in play mode. You cannot forget it because it's super, super important. Uh, but you know, on the bright side, it's awesome to be able to mess around with things while the game is running. You can do so many tests and things. And for debugging, it's amazing. You have some problem and you're like, what, what is this? Is this? Is that because of this speed? And then you can change that speed and find out. Um, so that's great. The other pitfall to be aware of is right up here, this says speed equals 10. But here in Unity, it says speed equals 20. They disagree. Uh, which one is going to be right? I don't care. I know the answer to this because I've learned it the hard way a million times. We don't care. That's not the kind of thing we ever want to have to think about. If there's information is being displayed in two different places in a conflicting way, we must avoid that. That's a terrible situation because you will. If if I tell you, as it happens, it's the inspector that overrides the code. You're not going to remember that <laughs> in six months' time. You're going to be doing this thing. And you're like, right here it says speed is ten, and when I debug log speed. Look, speed is equals 10 right there. Very next thing, debug log speed. And when I start the game and I look at this console, it says 20. How is that possible? I've had times going out of my mind trying to figure this out. Like it says right there that it's 10. So don't write that there. You don't need it. Um, we're gonna, once it's a public variable, we're gonna set it in the inspector. We don't need to set it here. Uh, if we did for some reason wanna set it in code, we should set it here in the start event. But um, I'm going to, put a notice for us here, never set the value of a public variable here. Uh, the inspector, that's the window in Unity we're looking at, will override it without telling you. Uh, if you need to, set it in start instead. But we don't need to do that yet because we're setting it in the inspector. Setting it in the inspector is actually a nice way to work. If you, if you set it in start, then you'd have the kind of the other way around where the thing that's in the inspector is going to be overridden. But at least in that case, you can see in the code why it's happening. Um, and in our case, we're not going to do that. We're just going to, we're declaring the variable. We're saying, look, there's going to be this variable called speed. It's going to be a number. And I want the whole building to know about it. All the meeting rooms going on here, you all need to know about speed. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is. That's, that's going to be set by Unity. Um, so we did all that. Sorry that it's taken a little bit to get to the actual bullet stuff, but now let's do some bullet stuff. <laughs> so we've got movement up here. Uh, this, this firing a bullet, it's going to be much like, remember the very first thing we ever did was like, if you left, if you left click, let's move us forwards. Our code is going to be pretty similar to that. Uh, so let's put it in the same place. Um, it's going to be click to fire. And um, we want to write something like, uh, if clicked, create a bullet at our current position. That's just a comment, that's not code, we haven't done anything yet, but I'm writing it out because um, the stumbling block we're going to hit here is what is a bullet? Like, we're about to tell the code, like, I know how to write if clicked, you know how to write if clicked. Um, and I know how to write our current position as well, that's transform.position. But how do I write bullet here? I can't just write the word bullet, it's not going to know what the hell we're talking about. Um, we need to go and create a bullet. What is a bullet? We get to make that up. <laughs> the joys of this job. So we're going to go to the same way we created a, the ground and the player. Game object, 3D object, cube. It's going to create some random location. We'll just put zero, zero, zero here. It actually doesn't matter where it goes this time because um, 
let's actually, it's a good habit to be in scene view, not game view, so you can actually manipulate these things. Um, as a bullet that's rather similar to our player character, we want to make it kind of long and thin. Um, but rather than type in values here, this time we're actually going to use, over up here in the top left, all these little buttons are different like modes of editing things in the scene view. Use these a lot if you're going to set up, um, if you're going to sort of design levels in the scene view and do a lot of editing there. Uh, I don't use them that much because I'm often making games that kind of generate things. Um, but uh, this one is a really useful tool, the, the rectangle one. It's called the Rect tool. Um, it lets you, it kind of gives you handles on things where you can just drag and resize uh, in a very kind of fluid way. So when you're making this, we want to make an oblong thing. Uh, just check that the direction that it's long in is the Z direction. Remember this little widget up here tells you which direction Z is, the blue thing. Um, our thing wants to be long in the Z dimension and short in the others. Uh, and actually, it's probably st a bit too long in the Z dimension, make it a bit shorter. Uh, so compare that to our player. If we click around here, uh, this little, the arrow one, that's the one we started with, the useful one for just dragging things around in 3D space. Uh, we don't care where this is, like, like I said, but just to get a size comparison. Yeah, that's very big for a bullet compared to if our player is, I don't know, a human, but it isn't. Um, but that's good enough. I like that. Let's name it. It's a bullet. But now, we don't actually want it to be in our world, right? We don't. The way you make a bullet during gameplay is not to like pick one up from the ground and throw it out. We actually want to create a bullet in code. And to do that, we need um, to have... A, uh, to have a bullet in our assets folder. We've got to create a sort of permanent bullet. We have to create the idea of a bullet, the platonic idea, ideal of a bullet, uh, so that the code can have in its mind so that it can, at a moment's notice it can summon it um, from what it knows. So the way you do that is just drag it in there. <laughs> just drag the bullet into the project folder and it pops in there. Now, we've created a prefab. A prefab, prefab is short for prefabricated. Um, I guess prefabricated object, I don't know, prefabricated thing. Um, in other words, here's one we made earlier. It's a thing that was made ahead of time, it was made before the game starts, and the game knows about it when the, when the game runs. And uh, that means we can copy from that. It's like a master copy. We can take um, copies of it. Anytime you want to create a bullet, just look at that prefab bullet and make a copy of it. Um, and as such, it lives in the project folder. It doesn't need to live in the scene at all. Now that we, we've... Um, saved it to the project folder, it doesn't need to be here. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that wherever possible, you try and avoid having um, both a copy of the prefab and the prefab itself. So this is a copy. If I change my mind about how this looks uh, and think, actually, I want the bullet to be like this and like this, and that's the kind of bullet we want in our game. Um, we haven't changed the prefab, we only changed the copy of it. And it can get in a bit of a mess trying to keep track of where you're editing the copy of the prefab. Again, it's a pitfall where you can um, get you know, absorbed in your work and do a lot of work and then realize, oh god, I just made all those changes to the wrong thing. Uh, so in our case, we don't need to make changes to the copy of the bullets. All bullets are going to be the same. If we ever want to make a different bullet, we'll make a different prefab. Um, and so this instance, this copy of the bullet, we're just going to delete it. And when we delete the copy, we're not deleting the prefab, we're just deleting the, that one copy of it. Um, one way to think of it is it's like uh, if you had a document and you photocopy it five times, um, you've still got the master document, the original, and all the others are just copies of it. Um, and yeah, you don't want to get in a situation where you make a bunch of edits to a copy and then realize, oh, I meant to make that to the original. So now that we've done that, we still don't have a way of referring to it in code. We want to write bullet here, but actually, even though we have a thing called bullet, uh, the way you reference these things is you never want to be looking them up by name. There technically is a way to do it. I really don't recommend doing it. It has so many problems with doing things that way. Um, so you always want to uh, do it the way we're going to do it, which I can't summarize in a single sentence. So uh, this is why I wanted to do the, this public float speed thing first, because now we know if we declare a public variable up here, we get to see it in the inspector. So if I write public game object bullet prefab and just end that with a semicolon, I'm not telling you what it is yet. I'm just saying there's going to be a thing. It's going to be a game object and we're calling it bullet prefab and I want it to be public. I want the inspector to be able to see it. And that was on, so just to 
be super clear, we made that change on player behavior. So we go back to our player object and find player behavior. And right next to where our speed is, now there's an option for bullet prefab. And again, we just drag it in. If you still had the copy of the bullet prefab in your scene, you might be tempted to drag it from there. Don't do that. <laughs> you need to be very careful about this. Um, uh, a prefab, we want this to be a reference to the thing in the project folder, the, the platonic ideal of a bullet, the idea of a bullet itself, the idea itself, um, not any individual bullet in our world. And luckily, that's why we deleted that bullet, because that makes this, this choice really easy. The pitfall is gone. There's no ambiguity here. There's only one thing called a bullet. We drag it in there, and we're done. Uh, so that's why I recommend doing things that way where possible. Um, so now that we've done that, we can refer to encode. We could write something like, um, instantiate brackets bullet prefab um, so instantiate is the word for uh, copying something and in particular you're usually using this almost always using this to take a prefab and make a copy of it and the copy is called an instance um, and so that's why the word is instantiate so take this thing and make an instance of it make a copy of it and so we need to tell it what we want to copy. We also want to tell it where. Where should it be? Where do you want this copy? Well, we want it at our position, which is transform position. Um, and then you also have to say which way should it be facing, which is fair enough. Um, uh, it doesn't want to know just where in the world it should create, but like which way should it be pointing when we create it. And so we just want it to face our direction, whichever way we're facing. So transform.rotation, that's the name for which way we're facing. And then semicolon at the end, and that is it. That will just create a bullet at our current position. So now we're going to play. We haven't played in a while, actually. That was a lot of a lot of development without much playing. And hopefully it's going to let me click play. So now <laughs> we're creating bullets all the time. They follow us everywhere we go. Because uh, remember, our code is just instantiating it. We just put that in update. So that's happening 60 times a second. 100 times a second, who knows? All the time, all the time it can. It's going to create a bullet. And I just enjoy doing stuff like this because you sort of, if you, you would never intentionally design this feature because, especially as a, as a novice, that I would, if I thought about something like this, I think, well, the game would just crash. There's too many objects. It's going to completely fall apart. You know, I've tried spawning a thousand barrels in Half Life and it grinds the whole thing to a halt. Luckily, our game is way simpler, and we're not asking it to do anything complicated yet. And so you just kind of can have thousands of objects, and it's fine. Um, obviously, this isn't really the behavior we wanted, though. So um, first thing to fix is we should actually have it only happen when you click the mouse button. Um, and we know how to write this, don't we? Remember, we say if, and then we open normal brackets, and we call the input hotline, and we ask it about the state of a button. Hey, input hotline, what is, I want to ask you about a button. The button I want to ask you about is fire one, that slightly silly name for left mouse button. And then after the if, open some curly braces, uh, and after the line of code, close them. Uh, and it puts them on a new line, which is fair enough. So now that'll only happen when we're holding fire. So that's a step forward. around and we can kind of it's kind of like painting with them which I kind of like it feels very creative <laughs> we were trying to make a traditional uh, action game but we've ended up making a beautiful art package <laughs> and that's okay so I guess you could make little like bursts of them as well now now that it's click based oh yeah and so just to explicitly say uh, I said get button here instead of get button down if we wanted to be a semi-automatic fire get button down would mean this only triggers on the frame that the button goes down. Uh, if you just say get button, it's going to happen all the time that the button is held, um, which is a lot. <laughs> uh, and that kind of feels better, I think. I don't know. For now, I, I think just being able to hold down fire and have a load of bullets come out is great. It um, feels quite nice, and also it's going to be quite useful uh, for our purposes because we'll be able to see very clearly what's happening without having to mash the button a lot. Uh, so that's cool. The next thing is it doesn't move. Uh, it's, they're all a bit static as bullets. <laughs> One of the defining traits of a bullet, I would say, is, is how it moves. And we could do something here to like, after we create a bullet, get a reference to that bullet and then give it some speed. That's a valid way to do it. And there's, I would say, if you're doing something like 
the gravity gun in Half-Life, where the gun is picking the thing up and then giving it some speed. It might make sense to do that here because it's the it's the player that's doing it to the object. With a bullet, very debatable about like the physics of a gun, but um, I think just in terms of how our game is going to work, it makes sense for the bullet itself to know about how fast do I go and how do I behave. So we're going to make a, a bullet behavior. We're going to need one anyway because bullets will need to know things like um, when we're firing a million bullets off and they're, they're shooting outside of the level and stuff, eventually we want those to, to destroy themselves because otherwise you could have millions and millions of bullets just stacking up out of, out of shot. So we have our bullet. If we double click it in the project folder, it opens in this like... Um, uh, in the matrix, <laughs> basically, like uh, an infinite expanse, isolated from the rest of the world. We don't need to. We don't need to know where it is. It's not in our game world. We're just editing the bullet itself, and uh, we can just add a component to it. And just like we do with the player, we're going to scroll to the bottom of this and say new script. And just like we did with the player, we're going to write bullet behavior. It's just going to be a pretty general term for whatever we need the bullet to do. Um, and the nice thing about doing it this way is that we almost everything we're going to write is going to be very familiar. It's going to be very working within what we already know because I think the bullet is going to need a speed and we might as well make that public float speed. And we're not going to say what it is because we're going to set it in the inspector. Remember if you make something public up here, announce it to the whole building and you make it public, uh, you don't want to set it here because it could be overridden. Um, we want to set it in the inspector. Um, and in fact, let's go and do that, just so we don't forget. Uh, it'll take a little while just to notice that we edited the file. In fact, did we even save the file? No. <laughs> so it takes a very long time if you don't save it. And then speed pops up. It's zero. Defaults to zero. So we even get a value and just defaults to nothing. Um, our player moves at 20 uh, meters per second. Let's make the bullet move faster than that, let's say like 40. Mm, yeah, that's, that, that'll probably be a bit slow, but let's start there. And now in our update, we can just uh, do more or less the same thing we did when we wanted the player to move. So we're going to take our transform position. We're going to increase it by uh, some kind of vector times speed. And uh, yeah. Um, so what vector, last time we used vector3.forward, we could do that, but if we did that, our bullet will always move forward. <laughs> oh, it sounds right, but the, when we ask, when we call the vector hotline, we say, hey, what's forward? It's going to say, oh, that's Z. It's, it's that blue arrow that we've been seeing in, in the scene view. Like, let's go back there and just, um, I'm just going to go back to our scene and just explain what I'm talking about. Vector3.forward, we're asking for the, the the platonic ideal of forward, the absolute notion of forward. What is what is forward? What does it mean to be forward? It's it's basically uh, you could call it north. It's you know in our game view it's this way. I guess me doing that in front of my screen doesn't help you at all. <laughs> but it's you know what direction I'm talking about, uh, and it's always that direction. So whichever way the bullet was pointing, it would always fly north, which we don't want. We want the bullet to care about its own sense of forward. We want it to go the way it's pointing, not not just always vector three dot forward, which is this absolute term. So instead of vector 3forward we're going to say transform.forward. So that's just a nice um, uh, convenient term we have that uh, means uh, the bullet should look at its own whichever way it's facing. What, it, what is forward to you? <laughs> Let's go for the subjective notion of forward. So vector3.forward is the absolute forward, the objective forward, it's north, um, and transform.forward is your own forward, whichever way you're facing. Uh, and we could we can multiply that by speed and then we also need to multiply it by time call the time hotline and ask it for delta time which is how long since the last update to compensate for the fact that update could be running at any speed we don't know um so that ought to work um we could make it more like the player behavior by separating that out into a different variable but I, if you understood that then we don't need to do that of course, I can't ask you if you understood that. And now, bullets shoot out. And actually, the behavior we're seeing is exactly what I said we wanted to avoid, which is um, they do all go north. But that's not a problem in our code. Our code is completely correct. Uh, why are they all going north? Have you figured it out yet? 
because our player is always facing north. Our player doesn't rotate. We're moving in different directions, but we don't face those different directions. We're always facing north. Uh, so the bullets always go north. So uh, that's probably our next thing to fix. Let's see if we can make the player face the direction they're going in. Now for this, um, how can we do this? We need to know uh, what we're really doing here is at the start of the update, we're in one position. At the end of the, the update, we're in a new position. What we'd like to do is say, hey, look at that new position. Before you go there, look in that direction. Because we have, there's a pretty convenient way of saying, we can say transform.look at, and then we can give it a position. Um, so all we need to do is figure out where it's going before it actually goes there. And right now our code doesn't really support that because we do it one bit by bit. We do horizontal, then we do vertical, or do vertical and then horizontal, sorry. Um, what we really want to do is take that all together, uh, take both the horizontal and the vertical movement together. Imagine, if you will, a bunch of numbers that all come together. Does that sound familiar? Uh, that's what a vector three is. It's three numbers that come together. And we have a horizontal one that refers to the x-axis. We have a vertical one that refers to the z-axis. We don't have a y one uh, because we don't want to move in the y-axis at all. Uh, we just want to stay on this flat plane. Uh, so that will just always be zero. Uh, but other than that, we can make a vector out of this. So we can actually say, in the same way we defined a float up here for speed and for this max distance to move, we're going to uh, define a vector, declare a vector. Uh, and I want to call this input vector. And when you make a new vector, uh, because it's not as simple as just saying 3 or 5 or whatever, we're going to say new vector 3. Um, so we want, we want to create a new vector 3, and in brackets we're going to tell it what we want that vector 3 to be. So we could type in like 1, 1, 2, and then we've made a new vector 3 that's those particular values. Obviously, we don't want that. We want it to depend on some stuff. And in fact, we especially want that y value to be 0. Remember, this goes x, y, z. It's alphabetical order. And so the middle one is y. And the ones we care about are the first and the last one. The first one is x. Um, and what is the x value that's going to be? It's going to be the... Excuse me, I just very carefully selected the wrong thing. It's going to be the horizontal axis. X is horizontal. And then what is the Z coordinate going to be? It's going to be the vertical one. And now that is a vector representing... We talked before about like this, it treats WSD almost like a thumbstick on a gamepad. This is now a vector pointing in the direction that you're pushing the thumbstick. If you imagine actually pushing a thumbstick, um, uh, the vector we've got back now represents all of that movement. And we've got a whole load of errors down there. We're not worrying about them just yet. Uh, because what I want to do next is um, we've got that max distance to move. So we could say, um, uh, let me just check that this is correct. Yeah, so uh, vector three. Oh, yeah, I'm doing a little trick there. Um, so I can start typing vector. <laughs> uh, and I was going to say, the problem with that is it usually auto-completes to vector 2, which you don't want. Uh, but it's being annoyingly helpful, and it's guessing that I... Well, now it's saying vector 2, because it's I guess it's going by what I typed most recently. But anyway, I've gotten the habit of just typing v3, and it, the most common thing it knows about that begins with v and has a 3 in it is vector 3, so you can auto-complete that way. Uh, you don't need to do it that way, it's just a thing I find useful. Uh, we want to create a new vector that is basically how far we're going to move. And that's just going to be the input vector multiplied, oh sorry, input vector times max distance to move. So that is how far and in what direction we're pushing the thumbstick multiplied by how far it's possible to move. If we can move 100 meters then, and we're pushing it all the way to the left, we want to move 100 meters left. If we can only move 50 meters, uh, this is very big values for some reason, uh, and you're pushing sort of 45 degrees up there, we're going to move 50 uh, meters in that direction. Sort of. Um, so, and the re whole reason we're doing it this way is we want to be able to know what position we're going to move to before we move there so that we can look in that direction. Um, and so now, that's what we get to do. We get to say new position is our current position, transform dot position, plus this vector we're going to move by, which is how far we're pushing the stick, t 
times how far it's possible to move in this one step at our current speed. Um, so we know where, where we're going to move now, but we haven't moved there yet. So we're going to do this magic transform dot look at thing, which is new position. I love it when it's that simple. <laughs> like this, but this stuff is all complicated. We do this complicated work of like, okay, we're going to create a vector and then do something to the vector. I my style is to do it in a lot of different steps so that we're clear about what each thing is. The in, this is the vector that represents the input. This is the one. Uh, that's actually represents how far we're going to move and then this is the one that shows where we're going to end up um, and the payoff of all of that is hopefully the steps are reasonably clear to read and then at the end of it you just get to say hey look at that look at the new position <laughs> which is almost plain english for what, for what we want to happen um, but we haven't moved there yet so right after that excuse me right after that we're just going to do transform dot position equals new position remember um, when you do equals, a single equals like this, you're not asking if the two things are the same. You're saying they are the same. Um, I think the way I phrased it was that the, the code looks at it and says, oh, you say it's equal to new position? Yes, boss. Okay, whatever you say. Um, and that's done. And then this stuff, but this is just remnants of the old way. We don't need that. Um, so let's actually maybe even make explain what we're doing here and just say, find the new position will move to and then face actually let's do this as a comment after the line face the new position actually move there cool so now we should be facing the right direction when we go there all of this is is basically the same movement code just written a different way uh, this is sometimes called refactoring where you take functionally the same code but you've now it's organized in a different way and it can that can be useful to build on it and use it in a different way and in this case the new functionality we want is we want to be looking the direction we're heading to do that we need to know what is the new position we're moving to before we actually move there because by the time we move there it's too late <laughs> if you look at it when you're already there that doesn't give you a direction right look where you already are uh, don't know so that's why we need to know where we're going before we go there check that works yeah oh that feels so much nicer <laughs> it's funny what a difference that makes i didn't i didn't notice that was lacking when we did our movement code i wasn't thinking like oh we've got to do facing next it was only the bullets thing that, that made that and speaking of bullets let's try it yeah now it fa fires in the direction we're facing which is pretty cool um yeah so i think we are done with the actual lesson part and the screw around part is going to be a lot of fun because <laughs> now we've got things moving and uh, more than one object in the world would you believe uh, there's a lot we can do with this uh, just to mention there's still there are still things that are a little bit uh, imperfect about our approach here um, to do with like running this stuff in update uh, I didn't want to bog down this lesson with that stuff yet we will get to it um, but basically there are, there are certain sort of cases in which some of this might behave in a not entirely desirable way you could do a tutorial where you just rigorous you write some movement code and then you spend like six episodes making the movement code better and better and better and better and more and more solid and and future proof and all this stuff um that is not my style i like to get things working in some kind of way and then once it's fun then we can figure out other actual problems here that we need to fix and we will so lesson over um screwing around there's a lot of things that, that are potentially fun here so one thing i thought was thinking of as we did this when i said we defined in player behavior um this bullet prefab uh we just said hey it's a game object uh, we're going to create a slot for a game object and then we plugged in bullet we didn't have to plug in bullet we could plug in anything we could plug in what happens if we plug in the light <laughs> as the bullet type like we, we're telling the game now Create lights every time you fire. <laughs> the ground gets lighter. You don't see these things like flying. Well, for one thing, you don't see them flying off because the lights don't have the bullet behavior, right? The bullet, the bullet itself is what decides to move. Um, but if we go to our scene view, <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of lights going on now, and the thing gets brighter and brighter. This type of light, I think, is is like a not very dynamic one. Yeah, I mean, we're not seeing any like 
I suppose we are seeing shadows, but not from these, I don't think. Um, so that's one kind of madness. What if we plug the ground in? What if every bullet is the entire ground? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, wow. Ooh, that feels weird. Understandably. So we're getting obscured here because we're creating the ground. The ground is below us normally, but we, we create these bullets at our own position, right? So they're at our height, so they completely consume us. Uh, and then the nuttiest thing, the only other game object we have is the camera. Can we just fire infinite cameras? And will they be our camera? Yeah, they'll be our camera. <laughs> I don't know what's happening now, really. I'm seeing... Oh my god, I thought I was seeing bullets, but I'm, we don't have bullets, right? These aren't bullets. These are me. <laughs> I'm seeing myself every time I fire. There's still only one me. Every one of those cubes was the same cube, but each time we were creating a new camera... <laughs> This is, we've created a merry trail of destruction here. Um, so that's cool. I don't know if there were any good game ideas in there, but uh, it's fun to mess around with that. Um, you could also do, let's go back to just having it as a bullet. Um, but what if the bullet is incredibly slow? What if it's moving at one? What do slow bullets feel like? Oh no, that's me. I'm going moving at one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's, let's keep me at 20 and let's open the bullet prefab and find the speed there. In fact, maybe this is a lesson. Um, what if we... Uh, this is almost too important to put in a screw around session, but I'll, I'll cover it again in the lesson. But uh, if we want to make that clearer, let's select speed and we hit F2. F2 is the shortcut to rename things. It's the same in File Explorer, actually. That's how you rename stuff in File Explorer and, and other places. Uh, let's call this bullet speed. Oh my god, no, I've messed it up. I've totally messed it up. Why didn't that work? Is it possible F2 is not renamed? <laughs> uh, isn't that renamed? Okay, F2 is not renamed. Sorry, ignore me about the shortcut, but right click it and say rename, and then we'll say bullet speed just to stop us from getting confused about that in the future. Uh, we're now looking for bullet speed. After a second, it's going to update here. And let's try setting that to 1. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. Not only is it slow, but you sort of, you forget what direction you created them in. And then they, sl oh my god, this is super cool. And I, oh no, sorry, I need to get back to the scene. Whoa. <laughs> I love that. I don't know what it is, but I love it. So another thing I thought about was, what if the bullet, instead of being long and thin like we made it, what if we make it just 1 1 1 scale, same as the player? What do player shaped bullets feel like? Ooh, and they're still slow, it's like, it's like I'm a weird hyperdimensional slug. <laughs> I actually, crazy as this sounds, I want them to be even slower. If I change it here, I can change it like 0 0.1. Um, Remember, we're in game mode, so we're going to lose this work. This is temporary work, but uh, it won't affect the existing bullets, but it'll, it'll affect the new ones they make. And they, that's just a very slow drift. That might be too slow. So, um, huh. That actually looks like the change did get saved. Hmm. <laughs> Let's not think too hard about that. Uh, my warning stands in some contexts, maybe not in this one. Um, let's make 0.5, and then there's one other crazy idea I had, which is, what if every time you fire a bullet, uh, you do change position as well? What if you go higher? What if your transform dot position is increased by... Um, remember how we had vector 3 dot forward before? What about vector 3 dot up? And we multiply that by, we don't want to go a whole meter up every time we create a bullet because we're creating thousands of them. So just create, uh, multiply that by zero, one. And if I do that, it's going to be an error. This is another thing that's too important for a screw around session. So I'm going to have to explain this in a future tutorial. If you do a decimal, you've got to put an F after it. Okay. For reasons. <laughs> in the real tutorial, maybe I'll try and explain the reasons, but it's boring and stupid. 
Um, and so now we're going to ascend slightly when we create a bullet. Slow bullets, and oh yeah, we're getting higher. Yeah, so this is what I wanted. So we can spiral around on ourselves. Oh wow. It's slightly, it's become quite creepy. <laughs> we're like a worm now, like a time worm. It's creating a sort of unfolding chaos of geometric hell. I'm just going to go back to scene view so we can see it better. Oh, that's super cool. What if, if I zoom out like this, we can actually do something fun because, um, uh, not fun, useful. <laughs> What's that other thing? Uh, if we click on the camera here and go to a line with view, just like we did in scene view before, now I, that's our game view as well. So we can carry on, let, let the scale go crazy. Whoa. Oh, it's confusing though, because I keep expecting the controls to be player relevant. Oh, I've also just, I've put the camera facing the wrong way. That's the problem. That's why it feels weird. Oh, look, it's all separating now. All these early blocks have become separate objects. It is starting to slow down a little bit on my end. I guess I'm also streaming it as I do this, or recording. But that is super cool. If you're not a little bit excited about being able to do wild things like that so easily just by changing some values, then, um, well, I don't really have anything to say about that. <laughs> I just think, I think it's cool. I hope you do too.